Opinions expressed by the host of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. The Center for Autism and Related Disorders advises working with a board-certified behavior analyst who has experience with autism before starting any intensive behavioral intervention. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. Welcome to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod. We're webcasting to you live from the Center for Autism and Related Disorders headquarters in Tarzana, California. It's Friday. I know that isn't necessarily always a good thing, right? Especially when you have a child on the autism spectrum. Somebody was messaging me this morning and talking about how overwhelming Saturdays can be. Yes, I remember that well. Um, I will tell you that honestly, I now I look forward to the weekend. I really, really do. Um, it's a time when our family gets to be more together. Together. It was not necessarily that way when we were going through the early years of intervention, but I'm just letting you know that it isn't. It doesn't always stay that way. So uh, something to look forward to. And I am looking forward to being here today with you for the next two hours live, talking about autism and all the different facets of autism and all the different ways that we can help ourselves and help other people in our lives to reach their fullest potential. Uh, not just when they're on the autism spectrum, but especially when they're on the autism spectrum. Um, we talk a lot about ABA here, although it's not the only thing we talk about. Um, and we do talk about ABA because it is the only scientifically proven effective treatment for autism. And by the way, <laughs> excuse me, proven to be effective at helping all of our kids on the autism spectrum to make progress and move closer to reaching their full potential. So really, our show here is, is meant to help uh, parents, teachers, practitioners, and young adults and adults on the autism spectrum to really define what they want to work on and help them to find the tools to do that. And sometimes it's specific skills, and we talk about specific skills. Sometimes it's working on dealing with the emotions of what's happening, dealing with the financial situation of what's happening, um, dealing with what are we going to eat and how are we going to put it on the table right all the, we get down to the nuts and bolts uh, of all of this and of course we are uh, meant to be an interactive show so we will talk about the things that you guys want to talk about you are invited to uh, partake interact engage and tell us what you want us to talk about ask questions provide suggestions comments because I know that you guys are a wealth of information I learn from you guys every single day and I've got some specific things that I'm hoping somebody out there knows a little later on. But uh, there are lots of different ways to interact. Matt's going to show you some of the different ways that you can inter interact right now on the screen. And I want to remind you that if you're watching us live, and there's only one place to watch us live, and that's www.autism-live.com, that when you go there, uh, you see a lovely desktop. And on that desktop, there is a box that says your uh, the questions that we're answering right now. It's an empty box. You can put your cursor there, type in and put whatever you want in that box, hit enter, and it shows up here. Now, I know yesterday we were having some technical difficulties with that, and apparently the feature was there and active, but for a great period of time, I couldn't see your responses. And so there's some of them here that came in, and I'm not sure what they were referring to, but we'll talk a little bit about that later on. But it is working today. I can see today. And um, so write into that box and tell us the kinds of things that you're interested in, that you have questions about, that you have concerns about. Um, or it can just be, you know, doing a shout out because I woof, there are times on this journey when you just need somebody to know you're there right let me know you're there I know you're there but let me know and I will acknowledge because uh, I can see it today <laughs> it's a great thing it's a good day uh, and we'll see what comes live show we never know what's gonna happen um, and you know <clears throat> anything could happen 
Can I tell you, can I give something away? That yesterday was a big day for me because on my voicemail yesterday, who called me? Temple Grandin called me yesterday. And uh, she's excited she's going to be on the show at some point in the future. We haven't set the date yet, but she very much wants to be on the show. It's a very exciting day for me. I called my husband immediately. I was like, you won't believe. I almost dropped the phone when I listened to the message. And I was like, Temple Grandin called me. Um, it was very exciting. And I can't wait to talk to her. And I can't wait for you guys to be able to ask her questions. Because that isn't something that you get the opportunity to do on a daily basis. But. Um, and you can even start now by sending in your questions because we'll, we'll be setting the date uh, of when Temple will be on the show, but it's not too early. You can be writing to me saying, you know what, I'd really like to ask her. Uh, okay, we do like to start every morning with something that I fondly refer to as the jargon of the day. This is the time of day when we take one word, one phrase, and try to make sense out of it. Um, these are terms that can be so very overwhelming and you're sitting in a meeting somebody uses them and it's not like it's just a, a word or a phrase that gets slung about these are things that they're using to refer to your child and using to refer to the help that they're going to give your child or the help that you need to help them to find for your child so the stakes are high with the jargon and I I think it's one of the reasons why it can be so overwhelming because it's a whole new language and it is overwhelming but um, we can we can do this si se puede right uh, just a little bit at a time like we teach our kids do it in bite-sized morsels so we take just one little thing a day and try to shed some light on it now our term for today is Asperger's syndrome and I promised yesterday that we were going to talk about this and of course it's a term that has been in the news a lot lately um, in conjunction with uh, the tragedy that happened in Sandy Hook and a lot of people have been asking a lot of questions and uh, a lot of people who don't know anything about autism have asked a lot of questions about it and I will say that as horrible as this tragedy was and and, and that's like you know, the beginning and, and the end of the sentence, right? Horrible, horrible tragedy and we always want to be mindful of that. Um, and, and really another devastating blow to the autism community because early reports that came out that said Asperger's syndrome is why this happened, right? And that was immediately retracted and there was a whole flood of information that came out. Um, if there's anything, I'm always looking for what's the good takeaway in anything. Um, I do think that whenever a conversation starts and is able to continue, hopefully, if we make sure that the right information is out there, then it can be a positive thing. Uh, so we certainly want to be a part of that end of things, being clear about what Asperger's syndrome is and what it's not. So let's take a look at what our actual definition of Asperger's syndrome is. It's lengthy, right? Uh, but we want to be specific here in these actual definitions. It's an autism spectrum diagnosis given to individuals who display the following. Repetitive routines or rituals, we talked about this yesterday, this can be lining cars up or having an inflexibility, um, rigidity about, you know, you have to do things one way, you have to go to school one way, um, you know, have to use the restroom in a certain uh, order, uh, food has to be eaten in a certain way or look a certain way or taste a certain way, right? Inflexibility, those kinds of things. Peculiarities in speech and language such as speaking in an overly formal manner or or in a monotone or taking figures of speech literally. Um, so while we don't see the delay in language acquisition, we do see that sometimes there is that, that peculiarity that the speech is there, but it's a little automated. Um, Sometimes we uh, will refer to it as monologuing, that they're not really having a conversation, but they're spouting facts as if they're lecturing um, to an unknown classroom. My son certainly does that. Um, and he does not have an Asperger diagnosis, by the way. That can be part of autism as well. Uh, another symptom, socially and emotionally inappropriate behavior and the inability to interact successfully with peers. Now, want to be clear that when we're talking about those inappropriate behaviors, like asking things that other kids would be like, you know, we don't ask that in this situ situation. But you'll notice that it doesn't say violence. 
Um, and, and we should not read violence into that sentence, right? Uh, problems with nonverbal verbal communication, including restricted use of gestures, limited or inappropriate facial expressions, or a peculiar stiff gaze. Um, so, you know, not reading the signs along the way that somebody's sitting there and saying, you know, and they're not getting that that's a no. Uh, just one of the possible uh, examples of that uh, particular issue. And then this last one, clumsiness or uncoordinated motor movements. That's the only one on this list that isn't part of an autism diagnosis. Um, <clears throat> And I remember the first time I looked at this, I was surprised. I didn't realize that that was part of an Asperger diagnosis. And um, it should be noted that, again, that all of these things are also included in a classic autism diagnosis, but you'll notice that what's missing is the a uh, acquisition of language deficit because children who are on the autism spectrum don't have uh, there, there is no, they're not behind in terms of acquiring language, which is one of the reasons why Asperger's often doesn't get diagnosed until a child is over the age of five. In fact, there are people who don't get diagnosed with Asperger's until they're in their 20s or their 30s. Um, and there are certainly a lot of teenagers that are now being diagnosed with Asperger's parents who've said, you know, we've looked at this and we, we, we just don't get it. We don't know what's up with our kid. You know, there's always been in some quirkiness, but you really start to see these difficulties uh, socially crop up um, when you get into the teen years, and, and that is when a lot of people will get a diagnosis. Uh, of course, we know that an early diagnosis it really is beneficial to those individuals, um, that if we can get in there earlier and work on social things, then we see that there is success with them. But uh, that is the actual definition of Asperger's Syndrome. Now let's take a look at what our working definition is, an autism spectrum disorder that does not involve a delay in language acquisition. And then the added thing to it is that uh, motor clumsiness, which can be helped with uh, occupational therapy and adaptive physical education. So I wanted to be, and we cover this from time to time on the show anyway because it's important, you know, um, our, our kids get a diagnosis and while I'm one of those people that thinks that it really does not define them. Um, there are people who will define our kids this way, and I think it's important for us to know what the differences are. Uh, recently, somebody was talking to me about somebody in their family, and they said, oh, we think we think he has Asperger's. And, uh, and, and I said, really, what are you seeing that you think that the child has Asperger's? And they were telling me a whole bunch of different symptoms, and I said, well, definitely, you want to get that child looked at, but I can tell you that you've expressed that this child is having a delay in language acquisition, which means they're not going to be eligible for an Asperger diagnosis. That doesn't mean that they have or don't have autism, but if they're if there is a delay in language, you're not going to be eligible for an Asperger diagnosis. So, um, something to be mindful of, um, that you could pretty much, if, if your child is not acquiring language on a regular rate, on a neurotypical rate, if they're quite behind, they're not going to be diagnosed with Asperger's. They might be diagnosed with PDD NOS. They might be di diagnosed with autism. They may just be diagnosed with a speech delay, but they're not going to be eligible for an Asperger syndrome diagnosis. All right. Um, we always like to start. Oh, well, I did want to say this, um, that in, in people talking about the tragedy in Sandy Hook and linking Asperger's, I do not know what that young man's diagnosis was. I have, I have no ability, I have no expertise in diagnosing anyone. Um, so I cannot speak effectively to that. And I think, unfortunately, a lot of people who, like me, are not experts and did not know this young man have had a lot to say about what his diagnosis was or what it wasn't and what he might be have been capable of. But what we see clearly, the takeaway here is that there is nothing in this Asperger diagnosis that talks about violent behavior. Now, I know that a lot has been said and there have been blogs written by parents who have been honest enough to say, you know, I, uh, the one blog in particular, and it's been very important to me in the, our, all of our coverage of the Sandy Hook um, tragedy to not 
name the shooter. Um, and so when I talk about this blog, there is a blog that's out there that says, I am, and then it uses the name of the shooter, and it says, I am his mother. And then you read the blog, and, it, and it's not his mother, but it's a woman who feels that she relates to what the mother may have been going through, because she has a child who is diagnosed on the spectrum and is violent. And, um, and I want to say very clearly that when my child was little, uh, before we got help, my child was violent. My child was violent towards me. He was violent towards himself. It is not unusual for children in their frustration of not being able to communicate to uh, express themselves in a way that is violent. It is not a part of the diagnosis. There are many kids who are on the autism spectrum that never went through that phase. It is not a part of the diagnosis. It is something that can happen um, when a level of frustration has been reached and they are not able to communicate, but it is not a part of the diagnosis, and I hope that that's clear. Um, because that can be a little bit confusing. And I know I was concerned when my child was young and when he was violent and when he was violent towards me and when he was violent towards himself, I was like, what's going to happen? Where are we going to be when he is a teenager? We got help. And it was explained to me very clearly that what he was expressing was frustration, that it wasn't that my child was a sociopath. Um, he was violent to me specifically and violent to himself because of he, he had no way of communicating. He had no way of understanding what was happening. Um, that should not be confused with a young man who clearly could communicate and clearly was you know, able to express himself um, verbally, right? Um, what went on with that young man, I don't know, but it was not a part of his Asperger syndrome diagnosis. And we shouldn't confuse that violent behavior in children. You know, it would be like saying a child who's throwing a tantrum, any child, not on the spectrum, whatever, who throws a tantrum and punches somebody is going to grow up to be somebody who punches people. We know that's not the case, right? So I really want to say to parents who have children on the autism spectrum, do not fear um, that this is who your child is going to grow up to be, see the behavior for what it is, and get help. Don't just let it go, because if the child doesn't ever gain functional communication skills, they are going to continue to express themselves in that way. That was not the case with the Sandy Hook shooter. Um, but we have a job to do as, as parents to help our children um, and help our young adults to deal with feelings of frustration and to deal with them appropriately. Um, but again, I think it needs to be said, it, not a part of this diagnosis. And if you're curious at all and want to hear from an expert, Dr. Jonathan Tarbox, a couple of weeks ago, filmed for us, there was an official statement made by the Center for Autism and Related Disorders about the shooting and about it being in any way linked with an autism diagnosis, and he speaks very eloquent to that. It is available on our Facebook, and it is also available on our YouTube page, and then you can hear it right from an expert. Um, but I do want to take a moment to speak to the moms out there and say, don't be afraid, but do get help and do ask for help, all right? But we don't need to fear our young people with Asperger's or with autism. They're loving people, and um, much more likely statistically to be injured by others than to injure anyone else. Okay, we always have a question of the day for you, and our question today, there it is, um, is what is your greatest talent? What is it that you're particularly good at? Let's, you know, we look a lot of times for our kids and say, what is their strength and what is their weakness? And we're asked that at school a lot. Um, and it, this is a good thing to ask ourselves as well, too. What's your greatest talent? Um, I know. <laughs> Recently, I, I, you know, I don't know what I would say to this for myself, but I know recently, um, I, my mother passed away just about a month ago, but before she passed away, she was telling me a story and she said, oh, you know, clearly, uh, it's a family thing. Uh, and she told me that my greatest talent was my ability to talk endlessly and that we used to see that as something that wasn't a positive. And now look, um, it's, it's worked 
working for me. And uh, sometimes. Um, but apparently when my father went to school, and he was the last grade in his state that didn't go to kindergarten. They just started at first grade. And on the very first day of first grade, they, his father had already passed away. And they went around the classroom and they asked all the kids in the classroom, what do your parents do? And so here he was, he was five years old, first grade, first day of school, and his dad had already passed away. So he felt, you know, different from the other kids. And, um, and he had a mom who was pretty much a stay at home mom taking care of five kids, recently widowed. And, um, they, you know, so he needed something to say, and he said, my mom is Frida Penrod, the great talker. And, um, and my mother said, you know, that he, everybody always shared that, that was, you know, family lore, but apparently it's true, and she said, clearly you take after your grandmother. Um, so there you have it. And I'll take that as a compliment. I know that sometimes it isn't, but uh, in this case, I'm going to take it as a compliment. But, and I have been able to talk my way into getting my son more therapy. I've been able to talk my son into getting more fu funding. Um, and uh, obviously, I, you know, I hold my own here talking endlessly for two hours. But I'd love to hear from you guys. What's your greatest talent? What are you really uh, good at and how does it serve you? It, today, it's Friday. Let's celebrate the things that we have in our plus column, right? It's a good thing to do. Okay, now we always uh, have a topic of the day or the week as it is. And uh, our topic this week, all week long, has been goal setting. And we're continuing that today, talking about our goals. You know, it's a great time. Uh, the beginning of the year, it feels like a fresh piece of paper in some ways, although really um, any month we could say, you know, is a new start and any week, any, you know, any Sunday, any Monday, any Saturday, any Tuesday can be the start of something new, right? But it is a time to reflect and say, okay, what do I want this period of time to look like and be? We're not saying resolutions because, you know, those go away, but we're doing goal setting. What was really cool was yesterday when I picked my son up at school, he had this written paper because they had done this at school as well. I should have brought it with me, but I already hung it up on the wall in the kitchen for the year. Um, and it was very interesting to me to see what he chose. I'm going to, I'm going to get the clumped here. Um, and, and I had seen an earlier, um, draft because he's working on writing things and taking something from one state to another state really great uh now in fourth grade and um but I'm, there were three things that he listed and one of them was that he was going to work on being better at conversation and he listed all the things that that was going to take that he was going to have to be a better listener that he was going to have to be more observant that he was going to have to be patient when he talked to people all these different things and, and paying attention. Um, then uh, I know for sure that another one of them was um, that uh, his handwriting, that he was going to be more patient with himself with handwriting and that he was going to practice every day and slow down when he does handwriting. And of course, I can't think what the third one was. <sighs> to look at it at home. But I loved it that he had these goals and part of what they're going to be doing in the classroom is keeping track of what are they doing. But he set himself three realistic goals and listed what it was going to look like and how he was going to do it. I just thought that was pretty amazing. Um, and that's pretty much what we've been doing all this week too is talking about, you know, setting a realistic goal and working backwards towards the goal. And today we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, really making sure that we reinforce ourselves because that's a big part of it. And when we can figure this out for ourselves, I think it makes it better at uh, figuring it out for our kids. So that's what's happening today. And today we're also talking about funding. Um, it's Friday and we usually talk about funding and I'm going to talk specifically, I promised you guys that in our getting organized and talking about things, we we're going to talk about paperwork and I am going to bring that into the funding situation. And we're going to talk a little bit about getting ready for the taxes. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I need this talk more than anybody. We have some compliance information to share with you a little bit later on in the program. And then in the 11 o'clock hour, I'm really, really excited about this. We're having Dr. Jonathan Tarbox. It's Research Fridays, right? And he's going to be joining us via Skype. And we are going to talk about this new study that just came out about children 
no longer uh, being able to be classified as autism after they had it. You know, lots of different words that people use for it. Uh, around here, people say the word recovery. I know that is not everybody's word for it. Um, but when you no longer qualify for a diagnosis and what does it look like, what does it mean, and is it a real thing? A study just came out. Uh, we talked a little bit about this on Wednesday because the media is saying, look, you can outgrow autism, and that just tears my ticket because nowhere in the study does it say anything about outgrowing autism. It talks about outworking autism, um, getting enough therapy so that you outworked it, but you didn't outgrow it. Ooh, makes me nuts. Um, <clears throat> but Dr. Tarbox is going to be here to talk about the actual study and take apart the research. And I know he's excited about it. He uh, talked a little bit about it on Fox News yesterday, but we have him for a length of time to talk about it and really delve into what it really means. Because when we get those headlines, eh, you know, it really doesn't cover what it needs to cover uh, and lead you to think some things that aren't in the actual study. So he's going to be with us talking about that, and you can ask him questions about that and more. Um, I know he's getting ready to go next week uh, to do a conference that we've talked about here that um, ABAI is doing, and it's a parent conference on autism. So um, we're going to be talking with him about that a little bit too, and maybe if we have time, we'll talk with him about setting goals and all of that and achieving our goals, both for ourselves and for our kids. So a really exciting day today. Um, lots of fun stuff to talk about that hopefully will be of use to you. So stick with us. We're going to take a break and be back to talk about making sure that we're reinforcing ourselves um, so that we can achieve those goals. Stick with us. Welcome back, everyone. It's the beginning of a new year, which means the possibilities for new beginnings and starting new traditions. So I figured for the month of January, we should make a calendar for our kids to use. The focus of this project will happen with your children after it's completed. All you need to do to make the calendar is to go to facebook.com slash autism live to download the template I've already made for you guys. And then the other materials you'll be needing are a scissors and some magnets which is super easy to find at your local craft store. Once you have your printed templates and you have your magnets, all you have to do is just take the paper and then assemble it onto the magnet. It's super easy. And then cut out all the shapes. That part is a little bit more tedious, but once you have that done, you're gonna have a calendar that you can use all year round for years to come. So let's get to it. Why is this calendar so cool? Well, first thing, it's that everything is completely modular, like I said before, so you can have your kids practice naming the days of the week and putting them in order. You can even ask them questions like, what month comes after January, for instance? Other things you can do with your child is having them, you know, label the different seasons and then assigning the seasons to the correct months. So there's different ways you can use this based on your child's skill level. And what's cool about this calendar is as your child grows, so is the use value of this magnet calendar because you can focus on more abstract things with your kid as they develop and work on simpler things with them when they first start working with it. And this is something you can always do every day of the week because the days change, right? So there's always an opportunity to visit the calendar and to use it in your daily lives. And these are just a few examples of the kind of activities you can do while playing with the magnet calendar. I hope you enjoy this activity and I look forward to seeing you next month. Until then, crack on. Can you see me flying by your side? Welcome back. Can I just say, I love this Smarty thing. I haven't had a second to make the calendar yet, but I'm really looking forward to it. I can see all these different applications for it uh, for me, but also for my son. I think visual is a great way to go um, for us and for our kids. All of our kids aren't necessarily visual, um, but it doesn't hurt, right? <laughs> it's just one more thing that can help along the way. Um, and I think it could be something that's really, really fun and fits on the refrigerator and spectacular. By the way, that template is available for you on our Facebook page, and uh, we really want to thank Suzanne Oshinsky for these wonderful Smarties. Wait till you see 
what she has coming up for February. I'm just going to tease out that it has something to do with puppets. And if you know me, you know I love puppets. So I'm excited to see it. Uh, I haven't seen it yet, but I've heard a lot about it. You guys have been writing in a bunch of stuff, and I just want to take a second uh, to talk about some of it because I'm just loving on you guys. Uh, <laughs> I usually am, but I just want to mention it. Um, a couple of things that came in yesterday, and I'm not sure what they were referring to, but I want to at least mention them. Um, somebody said, I get it, Shannon, but for me, it's like putting my son under a microscope. I feel like no one else puts their children under a microscope daily. And man, do, do I get that. I do think that that's one of the biggest differences between parents of kids on, on the autism spectrum and parents of kids that are just that neurotypical word because it looks like from my perspective that it's just happening in their world um, whereas I think we sit there and look at everything that they they do and a lot of us compare it and you know we can't just go and see our kid interact with another kid we're comparing and going how how are they behind how are they different how might they be ahead we're constantly uh, quantifying it all and I, I have a really good friend who does not have a child on the spectrum but who constantly reminds me stop trying to label everything good or bad start looking at things for what they are like <laughs> let go of that everything you know in the world is and and it, i want to put it into little compartments and say oh you know this is bad and this is good and it really isn't either thing and most things aren't um but you know that becomes part of my my self-talk it's hard though isn't it because we need to evaluate and we're going to talk about that in a moment to see how we're doing so and then it's hard not to compare at that point but i thank you for writing that in and reminding me that I'm not alone, that I'm there looking at it and judging everything and going, is that this, is that, is that autism or is that just the age that he's at? Was well, this, you know, uh... <laughs> And somebody else wrote it and said that you love that I reveal my feelings online. I'm glad because it's questionable and, uh, <laughs> and I don't always mean to. Um, so I'm glad that somebody gets a kick out of it. It's not my husband's favorite thing, can I tell you. Um, somebody wrote, oh, Mike wrote in this morning and says that is awesome, 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 referring to Temple Grandin. When you said she's going to be on sometime in the future, I jumped out of my power chair. LOL. Mike, I love that. Um, yeah, let me tell you, I was excited yesterday. I, I was really, really excited about it. We're thrilled. And I'll let you guys know when Temple is going to be um, on the show. Very, very excited. And you will, when she's on the show, have the ability to ask her questions. How cool is that? It's pretty cool. Um, okay, somebody wrote in and said, Hey, Shannon, I'm so glad you have the talent for talking because I'm the beneficiary of your words each day. Thank you. Uh, they went on to say, I used to watch Oprah daily. Now I watch you the only difference is you answer my questions personally. What a blessing. Thank you. Oh, yeah. My talent would be music. I can turn every lesson into a song, which has worked great for my mainstream, mainstream third grade son with his academics. That is awesome. And, you know, I'm always like, how can that be of benefit to all of us? And how, you know, I... I am smelling a new business for you. Uh, <laughs> what a wonderful thing, because um, I don't have the ability to turn things into a song. That is a great talent, and maybe that's something that you need to make a CD. Uh, I don't know, uh, but that's a fabulous talent. Good for you. That's remarkable. And thank you so much because I appreciate you being here with me as well. And somebody else who says, I never wanted to use the label autism for my son when he was first diagnosed. I wanted to say he was developmentally delayed because it wasn't a permanent label. And, you know, I'm, we have known this for quite a while in our family because uh we had services at the Center for Autism and Related Disorders, and they are unafraid to use the word recovered. And at first, when I heard this, I must say that I, the first time I heard it, I got excited. The second time I heard it, I got a little afraid. I was like, what if it isn't true? You know, I didn't want to get my false hopes up. And then I have had the opportunity in my life to meet young people who have recovered. And by the way, I have met some kids who recovered. There's a lovely video that I have to see if we can get our hands on um, that a couple of years ago, uh, Lou Diamond Phillips, you know the actor Lou Diamond Phillips, wonderful, talented actor from La Bamba and many other films. He was the um, 
ambassador for ACT Today for an entire year, that he, you know, did a lot of press things for them and helped them to raise money. And one of the different events that he did, he was at a conference, and he asked people in the conference, it was parents, and he said, who here believes that you can recover from autism? And a lot of people raised their hands. And... Um, probably more than 50% of that audience. And he said, well, for the people who don't believe, I have some people I'd like for you to meet. And he brought out like 10 kids, and I'm not talking about teenagers, kids, that were under the age of like 11, and said, and lined them up on the stage and said, these are all kids who were diagnosed with autism. And you know, let's take a second and talk to them now. They've been through intensive therapy and they have been deemed recovered, but I don't want you to take my word for it. Let's go down the row and talk to them. And oh my goodness, Whew. I don't think that there was anybody in the audience who wasn't weeping by the end. And you and these, he asked these kids questions and there were no questions written down on paper and interviewed each of these kids. It was mind blowing, right? And um, that was very exciting to me. And then I had the opportunity, we've had Laura Mariquin on the show. Her son is the exact same age as my son. And he started therapy just a little bit before my son. And I've met her son. And I've seen him play with my child. And I have said this before on the show, you know, I'm always, when I meet somebody who's recovered, I'm looking. I'm looking where, you know, how seamless is this? Uh, because sometimes, you know, people can be recovered and they're still um, unique. Um, and there are a whole lot of people who are unique who are not on the spectrum and never were on the spectrum, but you know what I'm saying. And where you can still see, okay, well, they are you can see what they're struggling with, right? Uh, which is not a bad thing, and I don't think uh, disqualifies them from a recovered diagnosis. You can see that there are things that I struggle with, right? <laughs> you know? Um, but in any case, uh, I look at Laura Mariquin's son and I can't. I can't see anything. And I've seen the videotape of him when he was little. That child had autism. I can't, I don't see it. He is just completely indistinguishable from neurotypical peers. He really is. Um, and that's an amazing, an amazing thing. And now I, you know, through my travels and, and the people that I've gotten to meet, I've gotten to meet a lot of adults who uh, recovered and some of them are not publicly out to the world to say, yes, I had a, a diagnosis and, and now I'm deemed recovered. They just, you know, they keep it to themselves because they're living rich and full lives and they don't want to be looked at as, as I look at people going, you know, where, where are your areas that you struggle with? You know, who wants that. Um, and they're amazing. They're really, really amazing. So I can tell you that I know that recovery does happen. And I can tell you that great minds are working for it to happen more and more because it doesn't happen for all of our kids. But this new study, um, uh, you know, we just keep adding to that because there are a whole lot of people who say, no, it's not possible. You never recover from autism. And, um, and I, uh, I have to say, you know, it's because you haven't seen it. Um, it does happen. And they're starting to look at why it happens and who it happens for and what factors. Uh, I just want to say my phone is ringing right now and it's Temple Grandin. And I'm not going to answer it right now. <laughs> but it's Temple Grandin. I can see the phone number. In any case, is that not exciting? Okay. Uh, oversharing. All right. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about goal setting. Um, and, and I am going to call her back. Um, don't worry. I will call her back. In any case, um, we were going to talk a little bit about goal setting today. And I want to talk briefly about um, preference assessments. We do this for our kids, and we should do it more for our kids probably than we really are. That's my case anyway. That when we're setting up a circumstance that we want a child, and, and this, we can do this with babies, right? You have a baby and you want them to learn something. You start with a, pre a preference assessment. A baby doesn't have language, right? And they may not even have gestures, but we set three things down on the floor in front of them. We set the book down, we set the teething ring, and the little fluffy bunny in front of the baby, and we see which one the baby starts to crawl towards, or that they reach for, or the one that grabs their gaze, the one that their hand reaches out to her. That's a preference assessment, right? And maybe we don't take the one time uh, as the whole gospel. Maybe we take all three things back and we mix it with other things, or we just take the three things and put them in different spaces to see, is it just that the baby 
is looking over here. Um, and they're always going to choose the thing that's on this end because in some cases, for some of our kids, that could be the deal. Or if we take the bunny and on one time we put it on this end, the other time we put it on that end, and the baby moves towards the bunny, no matter where it is, then we're pretty clear that this is a preferential item. They want access to this item. Then we do some sort of a lesson, and as and as the baby gets it right, whatever the thing is, that, and we're helping them to get it right, they get access to the fluffy bunny. And the fluffy bunny tickles them, and they get to hold it for a second and play with it. And this is giving a reinforcer. And we got the right reinforcer, or, or hoped to get the right reinforcer, by doing a preference assessment. And one of the things that they, they impress us when they're uh, teaching parents and practitioners and caregivers to do ABA is to do frequent pre preference assessments. You really can't do it too much. And think about it because, and I'm about to apply this to us, but you know, there are times when we say, you know, to ourselves, what do I want for lunch? Oh, today I want soup. Great, because that's really what I want today. But ask me that tomorrow. And I'm probably not going to want to have soup, right? Ask, I had soup for lunch. Now ask me if I want soup for dinner. I really don't want soup for dinner. I'm done with having soup for dinner. Um, you know, our preferences change minute by minute. And why wouldn't that be true for our kids, right? So frequent preference assessments are going to set us up for more success with our kids. But you know, the truth is that while we do this for ourselves by saying, what do I want for lunch? Oh, I want soup for lunch. We could all be better at applying this to when we set goals. That if we set ourselves the goal, and the goal that I gave at the beginning of the week that somebody had written in and said that they want to get their college degree. So we, I just picked an arbitrary number and said by 2018. Um, that they, you know, to get a college degree. Uh, and that's a long-term goal. That's a whole lot of time to go through to get that degree. And you're going to have to give yourself rewards along the way because that piece of paper at the end, while that's going to be really reinforcing on the day that you graduate, it's not going to get you there, right? You have to have frequent things that help you to get to that goal, that long-term goal. And it's true for anything else. Um, you know, and finding what's going to reinforce you is really, really difficult. But spend some time with yourself and say, okay, what is actually going to reinforce? And pair it with other things so that you can make something more reinforcing. I'm being told that I have to pair other things with working out because Working out just isn't reinforcing enough to me. <laughs> I know there are people, and once you start exercising, I can remember this in my life at other times, it has its own reward. You feel better, right? But in the beginning, hmm, it, not so much. So you have to pair it with other things that are appropriate, that are appropriate reinforcers. Um, and we have to remember to celebrate little victories along the way. We do this with our kids, right? We have to do this for ourselves. If you set yourself a goal and you say, all right, so, you know, uh, my goal is, you know, and I'm going to talk about paperwork uh, in just a little while, but my goal is to get my paperwork <sighs> together and sort it out. And, and that will be its own reward when it happens. There is no possibility that I'm going to be able to get it done unless I chunk it up because I can't do it all in one fell swoop. And then I give myself reinforcers as I chunk it up. And after a certain amount of uh, doing it and getting a reinforcer that I celebrate the victory of what I've gotten done. I have to make it a positive experience for me because I, we can't just be in the business of pulling teeth. We won't get goals met. And we, it's the same thing with our children. So frequent preference assessments for both ourselves and for our kids. You know, they say that our brain is this positive, assumptive computer, supercomputer. So whatever you ask it, it, it searches for uh, a positive answer. So if you say, you know, why am I such a failure at my paperwork? It's going gonna, it's gonna to search for a positive assumptive answer. You're such a fa failure at your paperwork because you're not good at it, right? But if I say to myself, how can I make it uh, really worthwhile for me to clean up this particular space that's covered with papers right now, my brain will come up with an answer. And sometimes the answer it comes up with is 
you know, completely unrelated to the paperwork. Uh, like what my head just said was some fresh organic blueberries, that that would be a huge treat for me that I could use as a reinforcer for cleaning up one pile of papers. I can do that. That's totally doable. So ask yourself the right question so that you get your brain, your supercomputer working in a positive, assumptive way for your own preference assessments, and then apply that knowledge to your kids and celebrate the victories. Uh, you know, we say catch our kids doing something good, catch ourselves doing something good and celebrate it. Okay, we are going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to talk about that paperwork and the taxes, and I'm going to see if I can't uh, get a date set with Temple Grandin. Wish me luck. Back in a few minutes. Stick with us. Hey, welcome back to Autism Live. We heard you. Everybody wants macaroni and cheese. Yeah, but we're going to make it allergy free. But here's what's the crazy part of this macaroni and cheese it's actually healthy. And it tastes good. Yeah, it tastes <laughs> really good. That's the most important part. Uh, so we're going to start. We got our water boiling. Um, there's so many variations on the pasta. Um, we're using today a corn pasta. We can verify with the manufacturer that we have a GMO free product. So let's go ahead and put that in there. Ooh, yeah. And if you don't mind, stir that sure. up for me, my friend. Now it's sticking a little bit to the bottom. Yeah. Is that okay? We maybe add a little more high heat oil okay. and spread that around again. One thing you gotta know about gluten free pasta if you overcook this, it becomes mush. Let's move this guy over to the Swap. other burner so you can see what I'm doing. And now we're gonna start with the old macaroni and cheese sauce. What's great is there's a lot of choices for, um, you know, different soups. And the way that I look at soups, and again, please follow the recipe on uh, your screen right now. I don't like to measure very often. Uh, but what I like to use is a creamy um, butternut squash soup. So this soup is great because it adds a lot of flavor um, to the dish, but also, gives people another serving of vegetables. With kids, we don't want to over season. Maybe with the adults, we can uh, season some for the kids first, pull it out, serve them, and then add a little more, you know, garlic powder or onion powder or other types of things into your dish. So the next most important thing on this recipe is we're gonna add in a thickener and the faux cheese. Now some people like their sauce really thick, so you just add in more cornstarch or more arrowroot, so that's not a big deal. How's that doing? You think, I think it's ready? I think it's done. Okay, so why don't we switch? I'll okay. take that, you do that. Okay. And um, I'm going to strain this bad boy here. Here, let me turn that off. Okay. Or we're gonna cause trouble again. <laughs> Trouble in Lisa's kitchen. Yeah. No. <laughs> That's another show. Don't. Yeah, right? <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and get this all strained. It's a good consistency. So I'm going to check to make sure our pasta is cooked. So really, you just want to make sure, just like any pasta, it's a little bit squeezy, a little bit. Nice. Dude, good job. Yay. We're good. It looks yummy. So even though the cheese is not totally melted, it's OK. Don't panic. What's important is that you're gonna love this recipe once you eat it. Um, what I enjoy most about this recipe is that it's, it smells good, but this That's stuff perfect. is amazing. So if you don't mind, I'm going to serve you some up and you can yeah. maybe blow a little bit on it so you don't burn your mouth. Sorry, I'm once a mom, always a like, mom. Just like we talk <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? Oh, but I can't wait, wait. I'm excited. <laughs> So I'm going to give a shot of this too, but oh my gosh, that is so good! This is the ultimate comfort food. So oh, it's so uh, good. Isn't it good. And I'm not just saying that; it is really <laughs> good. Mmm. Literally tastes like something our kids would really like, and that sweetness is really, really, really good. So the bonus for us is that when we're serving this to our kids, they're actually getting a full serving of vegetables in this. So instead of just eating a bunch of carbs and worthless calories, you're actually getting some good stuff in this. And um, we'll be back next time. I hope you join us again here on Autism Live. We're really loving the feedback. And if you have additional feedback, here's how you get it to us. You can send it to us via email at autismlive at gmail.com. 
on Facebook, Facebook, mm -hmm. facebook.com slash autism live. And also there's thousands of recipes waiting for you to discover them with pictures and different things on the Taka website. So you can hit Taka on the web, takanow.org. And we'll be back. Hopefully I'm, we'll get to do this again. I had so much Maybe fun. Maybe we'll have a little wine, but you got to join <laughs> us next time. We'll look forward to seeing you then. Bye, guys. We're going to keep eating. Oh. <laughs> you say hi, we say hi. Let's get right, let's get right. Let's get, let's get. Welcome back. We're officially playing phone tag with Temple right now, but that's okay um, because we will set a date and we will let you know when the date is set. Okay. Um, wanted to talk a little bit. We're going to take a moment here and talk about paperwork because we've been talking about goal setting, how to get our paperwork together and what that has to do with finances and especially taxes and autism. Um, so important and let me just tell you that I was up at five o'clock in the morning going through the sea of paperwork in the hilarious space that I refer to as an office which really isn't an office if you know what I mean um, at, at home and uh, I don't really have an office here either if you're looking at it <laughs> but um, paperwork is a huge nemesis right and if you have a child on the autism spectrum you I mean let's face it life is full of paperwork anyway and I I know some people who are very good at it but a lot of people are not and and then put autism into the mix and you might as well take the ocean of paperwork and dump it on your head right that's what the paperwork is like and it's paperwork that you have to get your fingertips on quickly sometimes and I had to prepare this financial thing that I've been working on for a couple of weeks and it's making me nauseous, right? Uh, and I was still looking for a couple of pieces of paper and going through the mountainous, uh, oh yeah, uh, in the quote unquote office. In any case, uh, it reminded me, and as I opened up, and I have a file cabinet, um, and I opened up the file cabinet, and I have a system that was set up. Uh, with the help of a friend that was set up for last January to sort through and do the paperwork for the year. It wasn't set up until June-ish though, um, but it was going back to January and I was going to be good and get all my stuff done and I did not get it done. It has now become not only a goal but a necessity for me to get it together and as I opened up the file cabinet and saw all the files labeled there and saw that they were empty, it occurred to me, hmm, this is a great time of year to start this. Yes, I have back years paperwork and I can save that for another day but to get our file cabinet set up so that at least we have the potential of being set up for success we talk about this sometimes with the dishwasher you know how sometimes you don't have time to clean the whole kitchen but if you empty the dishwasher so that the, your, the empty dishwasher is sitting there which means when you come back and you have an opportunity to stick some of the dirty dishes in the dishwasher you're more likely to get it done because you're starting with a clean slate okay we're going to apply that to our filing cabinet. Me first, right? <laughs> I, you know, uh, please know that I don't have this sorted out yet. But I had a friend who came and did it and set up first uh, on the one side, there are uh, folders for every month of the year so that if something happens and I can put it in that file folder um, and then on the other side there are a set of folders for every possible contingency there is a file that is just for autism there is a file that is just for my son so if there's a particular school piece of work that I want to say that I want to uh, scan into my computer later on I can put it into that file folder um, there is a specific file folder that is just for medical there is a specific file folder that is just for pay stubs there is a specific file folder for you know unfinished business uh, there's one for the lease <laughs> there's one for the cars and for insurance all the usual suspects of things that you need a file folder for um, and you know it's pretty much foolproof well uh, not last year for me <laughs> But it's there, and I had forgotten that it's there, and I think probably because it was started in the middle of the year. But here we are at the beginning of the year, and it's a new opportunity to start afresh. Yeah, there's still all of last year to be taken care of and filed, but I can save that for another day. And I can get a file box for that and maybe set it up there so that I'm archiving those, because there's a lot of stuff that could just be thrown away now, right? Um, and it becomes really important, and I see clearly uh, that some of the mistakes 
mistakes that I made along the way. I did not take care. Uh, there were years that I did take care of paperwork, not the last couple. Um, but I wasn't good about getting the full amount of taxes back. And that there are a lot of deductions that I'm told that have to do specifically with autism that uh, I am not, a, obviously, I am not a, a tax expert, but you'll want to consider now is a great time of year to be thinking about and planning for setting aside a little bit of money or raising a little bit of money, whether it's having a garage sale to raise it, but it would be money well spent to consult with somebody who understands taxes and autism because chances are that there's more money that you could be getting back, that the money you spend for that expert could be money that you could be spending on other things to help your child or to help the household or to just be more secure. Um, I'm, I'm told that that is money well spent and it's something that I really want to pursue this year. But I think that part of the reason why I didn't pursue it before was that it was overwhelming having to start from scratch with the paperwork. Even if you don't get to do it this year, if you start those files, and I'm going to pledge here that I am going to fill those file. They're set up already. I'm going to fill those file folders as the year goes by. Um, and I hope that you will consider doing something like that for yourself as well. So that n even if you can't do it this year, next year, when it comes time for the taxes, that then you can uh, easily pursue that. All right. We're going to take a quick break and come back and look at your responses to the question of the day. So stick with us. Every child with autism deserves a bright future. Without further clarification, the Affordable Care Act could actually result in less benefits for individuals with autism spectrum disorders. We urge Katherine Sebelius to clarify the Affordable Health Care Act. She can make one change, one little minor change, to make applied behavioral analysis be part of the health care plan. By signing this petition, you are protecting the health care benefits of individuals with autism spectrum disorders. We need to make sure that we are heard and seen. Sign a petition at autism-live.com. Here's how you can show your infinite support. Create your own infinity ribbon. What you're going to do is take a ribbon that's been cut about 8 inches long and you're going to grab one end and then twist it and then take the two ends and join them together and then tape it together and then I'm going to flip it around and take another piece of tape and what I have is double sided sticky tape, squeeze down, you have your very own infinity ribbon. With ABA, the possibilities are infinite. 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 I'm wearing my ribbon. Are you wearing your ribbon? Really want to encourage you to get your ribbon, wear your ribbon, and let people know. With ABA, the possibilities are infinite. Uh, wanted to talk about uh, your answers to the question of the day. And on one of our sites, we changed the wording a little bit and said, what's your greatest talent as a parent? And I uh, love what you guys wrote in. Somebody wrote it in and said, understanding. Oh, that's a great one. Uh, somebody else said, compassion. Someone else said, patience. Uh, someone else said persistence, all great qualities, you guys. Dependability, oh, that's a really good one. Uh, and someone else who said love, never knew love until I met my little boy. He has given me strength, knowledge, and a laugh a day, at least. For the last four years, my boy is severely autistic, and I wouldn't trade him for the world because he is the definition of love. How wonderful is that? That needs to be on a magnet on a refrigerator uh, uh, or crocheted on a pillow. Uh, another person who said patience, compassion, understanding, and quite an advocate. Yay. Love that. Uh, someone else who says perseverance. I will never give up on giving my child anything and everything that's in me to give her the best life possible. All of my profound love, empathy, and determination are packed tight 
and this perseverance. Love that turn of phrase. Uh, somebody else said, as a parent, my greatest talent is advocating for the child. Love it. Uh, someone else who says, learning from my kids. Uh, someone else says, loving my child. Uh, someone else says, loving and patience. Love is without a doubt embedded between a parent and child, sometimes an unspoken part of our lives, but it is always there. My greatest talent, I would say, is being my son's voice, speaking up in school for him so his needs are met. I don't, that just welds me up here. I'm going to get ugly here. Uh, another person who says... Uh, <laughs> This page is called Center for Autism and Related Disorders, not Center for Parents with Children with Autism and Related Disorders. Uh, it really gets getting on my nerve how every single thing you post is directed at the parents, uh, rest, uh, the parents rather than the people who do have autism. Very interesting comment. Um, and, you know, that is uh, a part of our show, um, it, and I do think it's a part of this journey at, that the what the parents go through. And um, sorry that you feel that way. And I am looking at the answers to the question on that we post this on the Center for Autism and Related Disorders and also on Autism Live. Uh, another person says, love, learn, and understand. Another person says, uh, I never forgot what it was like to be a kid. That's a great thing. I think my husband is really good at that. I'm, yeah. um, I'm, I'm the hard parent. I'm the the one who's always, you know, just like uh, Charlie Brown. Um, Another person who says, love for my child, acceptance was the key for me to move on. Absolutely wonderful. And uh, we're sort of out of time. Otherwise, I would run to one of the other sites. Um, but I do think it's, you know, um, I I would argue um, that there are always two sides to an equation, and I think that there needs to be, there is some support, and there needs to be more support, and we want to be here for individuals on the spectrum as well. Please don't mistake me in terms of that. Um, but I am a parent, and, and we talk about things about the parent experience uh, a lot um, because it, it it is undeniably a part of this journey. Uh, sorry if that offends, uh, but it is part of our mission. So it probably will continue. In any case, we it's time for us to take a break and go to the A Word. This is the wonderful documentary that's being made at the Center for Autism and Related Disorders following a little boy, Jack Riley. Uh, he was diagnosed with autism at the age of two. In the series at this point, he's about two and a half. So he's been having therapy for a couple of months and really starting to see progress, adding a lot of new lessons to his repertoire. Uh, they're distinguishing between yes and no as a, an answer to a question of do you want something so they're working on his preferences and his desires and yes and no and and for him to expressively say yes and no and notice the patience with which notice that the therapist would he gets it wrong a lot in the beginning here um, that they ask him you know do you want a shoe and he says yes and then he's got the shoe and he doesn't know what to do with it and then they ask him you know do you want something that clearly he would want and he says no um, all kids go through that phase. All kids go through that phase. It's really poignant for us because when it's a child with autism, they're going through it at a at an age when we we would hope that they would already know that, but they still have to go through the phase. So the patience that it requires, so that he gets the opportunity. You talk about giving ample teaching opportunities, and they only show a little snippet because they did this hundreds of times with him until he gets it. Oh, when I say yes to the thing I want, I get it and then once he has it he has it for the rest of his life but a great deal of patience for him to be able to learn it firsthand so take a look this is the a word jack riley jack riley say hi mommy hi. Turn and look at me when you say hi, Mommy. Hi, Mommy. <laughs> Good try. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Oh. So how are things? They're good. Yeah. Um, he's doing great. He's uh, He had an uh, incident. What are you going to pick? Fourth of July, we were out swimming with an, an, an old family out there, and he pushed a little girl in the pool. 
little three year old. Was he playing or? Well, yeah, she was. She was jumping in, and there was the steps, and her dad was watching. She jump in and sort of paddle to the mm-hmm. steps, and she kept doing it. Oh, and he was laughing, and she was laughing, and then he just helped her. <laughs> so it wasn't it wasn't uh, malicious. But yeah, yeah, he wasn't angry. I think it was. Just and they did it again though, after we uh, so we took him in. You want a cracker? We'll come and get it. There are two skills being displayed by Jack Riley right now. One is that he made eye contact, and the other is independently requesting an item without any prompting. These are both skills that he and his parents and therapists have been working on. Can you say, I want a cracker? Want cracker. Can you say, I want a cracker? <laughs> Cheryl is prompting Jack Riley to use more than one word for his request to build on his vocal skills. When Jack Riley began services three months ago, he was non-vocal with very little verbal skills. To be verbal is to communicate, whether it's with a gesture or signing or using pictures, for example. To be vocal is to communicate with audible words. So if you had to pick maybe like your top three things to work on like when you're out in the community. Trying to figure out what will make him compliant, you know, in public when there's a lot of people. He kind of took off twice for the street. It's inconsistent enough that you can't count on it. He, there's days that are great and days where he just, he does one of them. Or he'll say go. <laughs> yeah, go. He says stop and he says go and starts up again. Okay. Him staying with us, him even just walking hand in hand without, okay. uh, I'd say within fewer than 10 steps, he goes noodle and sits down. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a noun section in here. And then if we can, if you want whatever is, works for you guys, at least, if we can do it at least once a week. And then these guys go on an outing to wherever you guys normally go. Just to start getting him used to that. Because it seems, yeah, with the activity, everything changes a little bit from him. Just gets so excited. And that, that's when I think most reason stops for him. And most of what he learns sort of goes out the window. Yeah. Okay. We're going to spiral down. Spiral, spiral, spiral. <laughs> Yay! Uh, oh, to me, he sounds like he's talking more than before. I don't know. That's what I observed. Hey. Huh. You're talking a whole lot today. Do you want to play with your trains? Yes. Good. Okay, should we open? Open. Okay, say open, please. But the fact that he is actually communicating is really, really cool. And they're actually words instead of just, you know, um, utterances or, you know, gestures. Yeah, it's, it's really incredible. 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 Say, let's go. Let's go. Okay. Choo choo, come on. Right there, Jack Riley independently began playing with his train appropriately. What you see is what a typically developing kid would do, naturally. But kids with autism, most skills need to be taught until the behavior becomes natural. At this age, half of the ABA therapy occurs while the child is playing. The other half is in a structured environment and at the table, like you've seen in other episodes. You know the train station? Twice. Station. That's a hard word. Station. Yes, Do you want it? Yes. Okay, here we go. Wow, yes, yeses are very good. They are. <laughs> oh, and um, for NVI, we're also doing um, two-step actions within play. So, like, basically, whatever it is he's playing with, um, we just have to do two-step actions, and he has to be able to imitate whatever we do. Do this. Choo-choo. You do it. This will help generalize when he goes to preschool because other kids will, you know, be playing with trains too and children naturally just imitate each other. 
Right now, Jessica and Jack Riley are practicing using yes and no appropriately. Do you want the shoe? Yes. Okay, here you go. Yes. Say no. No. Good. Stop. Watch your fingers. Do you want the shoe? Yes. Say no. No. Good. So do you want the shoe? Yes. No. Okay. Do you want the ball toy? Yes. Okay, here you go. Ball toy. Here, here you go. Do you want a diaper? No. Okay. Do you want a ball toy? No. No? Do you want the cars? No. No. Do you want a Nemo car? No. Okay. Do you want bubbles? No. No? Yes. Yes? Okay. Boop puppy. Pop, 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 pop. Boop puppy. Boop puppy. Hi. Can you sit up though? Sit up. Stand up. Ready? Set. Go. We have new snacks for him because we started to incorporate gluten yesterday. So I've got uh, some stuff oh, okay, that he great. hasn't had in a long time. We tried like putting cut up bananas on his pancake plate okay, last wow. week and not so well. He just threw them down. So I thought like that kind of stuff would be easier now because he's been doing so well and he's not. Uh, so we're still going to have to have the battles. And I think we're just so happy to be done with the battle, the first battle, that we're sort of reluctant to start a new yeah, one, yeah. which is to start introducing new foods. Yeah. But the cool thing is now that we're taking them off of the GFCF stuff, yeah, we have more things easier. to introduce them to. Definitely. And maybe he'll just get less anxious if we're giving him things that he used to love this stuff, but we took him off of it. He won't remember, but maybe it won't be such a big deal if some of the new foods he's getting are things that he's loving. You want to try a cereal bar? Ooh, yummy. Are you looking funny? Oh, Jack Riley. Look better. Do you want to try cereal bar? Cereal bar. Cereal bar, good talking. Cereal bar. You want to try? Cereal bar. Cereal bar. Cereal bar. Clear. Cookie. You want to try? Cereal bar. Yeah. Try these. Love these. So yummy. <laughs> you want cereal bar? I see. Mommy? Bobby. I want. I want cereal bar. Good job. Oh, that was, good that was very clear. Yeah. Cereal well, bar. He sees it. So the more subtle we can get of it. Cereal bar. Do you want more? More. Can you say, I want more cereal bar? Cereal bar. I, I want what? more. Come on. Good job. Yeah. It is a cereal. That's your new favorite word. You have a new favorite, don't cereal you? Cereal bar. <laughs> Who's here? Who's here? Huh? Tell, tell Daddy what you just ate. I'm so What did you just eat? Did you eat something? What did you eat, Jack? Tell Daddy. Good place. Goldfish. Goldfish? And what else did you have? Anything else? What else did you have? What else did you eat, Jack? Cereal bar. What is it? Good, that's answering so the question. Like she asked me to do that. What is it? Cereal bar. A Nutri-Grain bar. So you you had a Nutri-Grain bar? And the fact that he turned to Daddy to say that too, that was big. Just right there, did you catch it on camera, Susie? Yeah, I did. did. That was really, I don't, and it was so nice. And he just answered questions about the past <laughs> to you. Uh, he just answered questions about the past. Like he never. That's true. The doctor right. last week asked if he could do that. Okay, I'm not going anywhere. I'm just right here. Right here. <laughs> the reason Cheryl is excited about Jack Riley answering Mike's question is that he was able to understand what he said and could recall what he had done in the past without any cues in front of him to remind him. Recalling something in your mind is a complex skill. This is a big leap. It means he grasped language. 
Welcome back to Autism Live. That was the A Word, a really remarkable ongoing documentary. You can find it on their website on YouTube. They have their own uh, channel there, and you can be watching all of these amazing episodes. There's so much to be learned from uh, about ABA and the arc of ABA. Really a fascinating, fascinating series. I hope you'll tune in for it. Um, but right now, we are joined via Skype by Dr. Jonathan Tarbox, as I promised. He is here usually on Fridays when we can catch him to talk with us about research. And we've got something really amazing that's a hot topic in the news this week, a new study that has come out uh, just published in the Journal of Child Psychology and Psychiatry. So we want to welcome Dr. Jonathan Tarbox. He, uh, welcome and thank you for being here. He is the, um, the head of research and development here at the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. And he is also the director of the Autism Research Group an amazing organization that does research based on what parents request. So um, thank you so much for being here, Dr. Tarbox. And I'm, I'm really excited to talk to you about this today because when news came out that this was going to be published, already the media jumped on it and there were some headlines that uh, I don't really match the study. Is that correct? That's correct, yeah. So some of the headlines we've seen say things like uh, some children may outgrow autism. Um, yeah. And this study doesn't, uh, it, really that's a misreading of the study. And, and if you actually look at direct quotations from the, the first author of the study, uh, Dr. Deborah Fine from the University of Connecticut, she specifically says, in fact, I think it was a New York Times article online, quoted her specifically saying, kids don't outgrow autism. Uh, she's been um, you know, studying autism for 40 years and until more recently when kids had access to good quality, um, top quality behavioral intervention, uh, it was very clear that kids don't outgrow autism. Maybe 5%, maybe 10% at the most um, are misdiagnosed or something like that early on. And so later on, uh, they, you know, they no longer have the diagnosis, but kids don't just outgrow autism. Kids can recover from autism if they have access to the right treatment early enough and at the right level of intensity. And yeah. even that is a you know a fair, relatively small percentage. We still don't know exactly which percentage of kids uh, can recover. But, um, but yeah, what the what the article is documenting is the effects of treatment. And the article very clearly says almost all of the kids in the um, in the group of children who recovered or lost their diagnosis received uh, behavioral intervention. Yeah. In fact, I've got a quote here from Dr. Fine from the Daily Mail, which was one of the places that their headline says children can grow out of autism. And and then, and, and then you read the body of their uh, report, and it includes in it this, this quote, direct quote from Dr. Fine, all children with ASD, autism spectrum disorder, are capable of making progress with intensive therapy. But with our current state of knowledge, most do not achieve the kind of optimal outcome that we are currently studying. And, uh, and she does talk about the fact that, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, where's my other quote here? Uh, uh, I'll find it, but that it's therapy, that, right. uh, that that's what these children seem to have in common. So this is not a growing out, as you said. Okay, so let's go from the beginning and talk about the nuts and bolts of this study. So a total of 34 children that they looked at? Yeah, right. So they looked at, what they did was they recruited um, <clears throat> children who were reportedly uh, recovered or lost their diagnosis, mm -hmm. right? Um, and they uh, found 34 of, the, of these children in the North Northeastern United States area. Um, and then they found uh, 34 children who were typically developing, um, and they were matched on age and uh, gender and nonverbal IQ. And then they found 44 children with high functioning autism, so okay. children did still have a diagnosis on the spectrum, um, but were also matched for nonverbal IQ, so these are very high functioning folks, okay. um, and also matched in age and gender. Okay, so you've got three different groups. Typically okay. developing is one group. Another group was used to have a clear cut diagnosis, doesn't anymore. Okay, that's the recovered group. They didn't call it that, they called it optimal outcome group. Okay. Uh, and then the third group is the high functioning autism group, because one of the uh, previous criticisms of the concept of recovery is, well, you know, these kids didn't recover, they're just really high functioning, but they still, you know, they still have autism, they still qualify for the diagnosis. Right. So Fine included this um, high functioning group as a comparison group. Okay? Love it. 
Yeah, I love it. And so basically what they did was they gave all of these kids and all three groups a huge battery of assessments. So they basically tested them, tested them on any, everything you can think of, language, socialization, uh, autism symptoms, uh, IQ, um, executive functions, uh, adaptive behavior, things like self-help skills, motor skills, you name it. They basically tested them on every area of functioning. And then they compared the, the different groups. And so basically the, what, what Fine said was the purpose of the study was to simply document does this group exist of right. kids who have recovered? Okay. She, again, she used the word optimal outcome, but it means the same thing. Right. Um, because there are a lot of people out there who doubt that. Oh, who yeah. say that this doesn't happen, you, you use the word recovered and people think that you've sprouted ahead and are seeing unicorns sometimes. So I love the fact that they were looking to say, does this exist? Okay. Right, exactly. Yeah. All right. that, that's all they're trying to do is just document, does this exist? Now, keep in mind, these folks were not, are not ABA providers. Uh, they uh, do different types of re research, um, diagnostic research, assessment research, basically just seeing what do these kids look like. That's the kind of research they do. Um, and so it's kind of nice, actually, to have people from outside ABA, yeah. evaluate, essentially evaluate the effects of what we're doing. Right? But they are respected researchers. This is not just somebody who, you know, just showed up and decided to do this. These are respected people. Oh, yes. They're, okay. yeah, they're very mainstream, highly respected researchers at top quality universities. Great. And this research is being funded by the government, by NIH. So it's Love all it. very mainstream, you know, top quality, gold standard type science. It's okay. on the up and up. We like it. All the up and up. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Night stuff. Uh, and so what they found was, yeah, yes, indeed, uh, there's no real significant difference between the recovered group, or optimal outcome as they call it, and the typically developing group. On all the measures that they looked at in this study, they were the same. There was a couple minor differences, maybe in facial recognition or something like that, but nothing significant at all. No differences whatsoever in um, autism symptoms. Wow. So, yeah, they just... It just clearly not justified to call the people in the optimal outcome group autistic. Okay. That label just doesn't mean anything anymore for those people. It doesn't fit them. Functioning just like their same age peers in, in every single area that they measured in this study. Um, however, they did find a significant difference between the optimal outcome group and the high functioning autistic group. Right? So that makes sense too, right? So yes. There is a difference between functioning levels of folks who are very high functioning but still have the diagnosis and folks who no longer have the diagnosis because their functioning level does, doesn't qualify them for that anymore. Wow. Um, yeah, so it's very, very, um, very exciting to see this documented in a mainstream medical journal uh, by mainstream, you know, very well respected researchers. Um, it's kind of funny too, though, because at the same time, I'm here to tell you that everyone who's been doing top quality ABA for the last maybe two or three decades has been producing recovery. We, yeah. This exists. We've been doing it every day. Okay. Yeah. So it's not really um, anything new or a surprise at all for the reality of the a top quality ABA uh, field. That being said, uh, in science, nothing exists until it's published. It doesn't matter how many times you've seen it, a right. good quality study on it, it essentially doesn't exist. So uh, it's exciting to see this getting published in mainstream journals because it's going to bring more attention to the topic and it's going to raise awareness that recovery is possible uh, among the mainstream scientific community. Now, my, my big question for you is that there are a lot of times when somebody is brought into the forefront and shown to be recovered, mm -hmm. um, the first question that people ask or, or that they suppose is, well, did they really qualify for a diagnosis to begin right. with? Did right. this study take that kind of doubt into consideration? Absolutely. In fact, that was one of the major strong points of the study. I, I'm going to explain to you what they did, and it was it was a neat little uh, methodological twist that they did that really helped with that. So what, what they did was they got all of these kids in these three different groups, right? Mm -hmm. They got... Um, um, uh, descriptions of their early functioning level as children, okay, and uh, and the early diagnostic reports, okay, for the um, for the high functioning group and the optimal outcome group. They didn't have diagnostic reports for the typically developing group, obviously, because right. they had a diagnosis, um, but they made up fake ones, okay. So they made foil mm -hmm. diagnostic reports that were real diagnostic reports from individuals who had other diagnoses, but not on the spectrum. Okay. okay. So now they have three groups of diagnostic reports. Then what they did was they got um, clinicians who were experts in diagnosing autism and autism spectrum disorders, and they gave them all three of those groups of diagnostic reports, but they were blind to which group they belonged to. Okay? And so they asked the clinicians, go over these reports with a fine-tooth comb and identify, 
do you think this person in this group qualified for an autism diagnosis at the age of three? Two wow. Plus, okay. okay. And, um, and what they found was, sure enough, through blind, you know, top quality diagnostic evaluation, the kids in the high functioning group and the optimal outcome group clearly qualified for a diagnosis. Awesome. And they were young. And there was no, no real difference between those groups, more or less. Um, Whereas the kids uh, who in the typically developing group with the fake, you know, um, diagnostic reports clearly did not qualify for that diagnosis. So I, I feel like that was uh, a pretty good quality, way, a very rigorous way to address this question of well, should we have autism? Uh, absolutely wonderful. This is absolutely fascinating. We're going to continue to talk about this, uh, but we're going to take a short break. Uh, so stick with us more with Dr. Jonathan Tarbox after these messages. Skills is an online program that provides assessment, curriculum, positive behavior support planning for challenging behavior, and progress tracking, and it does this all in one place. The Skills Assessment and Curriculum addresses eight areas of development, which even includes advanced higher level areas such as executive functions and cognition, which pretty much makes Skills the only ABA based set of curricula for teaching more complex skills, things like problem solving, planning, self management, perspective taking, and even inferring and predicting others' private events. Skills is a four step system. Step one is to add the child to your account. Step two is to start assessment. The Skills Assessment is the only ABA based assessment with psychometric research demonstrating the language subscale to have excellent reliability. Every area of human functioning and typical child development from infancy to adolescence was researched, making the skills assessment the most comprehensive of its kind in the world, and we're quite proud of that. Skills is easy to use. Simply click Start Assessment and begin answering questions, or simply type in a keyword, find specific activities to assess, and add activities to treatment. Step 3. Choose Activities. Once you've completed the assessment, Skills selects from a pool of 4,000 activities categorized by age, level, and skill type to provide you with exactly those activities each child needs. Start by choosing a curriculum, then a lesson, and finally an activity. Click the information icon to view prerequisites, ages in which targets develop, examples, and IEP goals. Click the video icon to watch a short video. Once you've identified an activity you want to teach, adding activities to treatment is a snap. Step 4. Start treatment. Here you can access customizable activity lesson details, add your own customized targets and exemplars, and edit an activity status such as introducing or mastering it. You can even print handouts such as worksheets, tracking forms, visual aids, and other materials. Skills also offers multiple progress charts, mapping curriculum progress, lesson progress, and cumulative number of activities and targets mastered over time. The Skills Language Curriculum is categorized by verbal behavior type so that users can identify progress for verbal operants, such as echoics, mans, tax, and interverbals. Skills is one of the only programs that provides the ability to write behavior intervention plans, or BIPs, for challenging behavior. With just a few clicks, the outline of the behavior intervention plan is written for you and ready to be printed and implemented. You can learn more about Skills today and get started by visiting us at www.skillsforautism.com or you can call us at 877-975-4559. Skills. Progress starts here. Welcome back. We're here right now with Dr. Jonathan Tarbox. He's joining us via Skype. He is the head of research and development at the Center for Autism and Related Disorders and also the director of the Autism Research Group, a really important organization that does research based on uh, what is useful to a parent of a child on the autism spectrum. So we love that organization. And Dr. Tarbox is talking with us right now about a new study that just came out from the Journal of uh, child psychology, excuse me, and psychiatry. And it is a study uh, about the optimal outcome in individuals with a history of autism. Uh, it has been misreported in the news that children can outgrow autism. We, we talked in the last segment about how that really is not have, have anything to do with what the study says. Um, but the study has some very clear things that it's saying about the possibility, the optimal outcome for children who have received therapy. Uh, 
to become virtually indistinguishable amongst their peers. So, Dr. Tarbox, thank you so much for staying with us to talk more about this. It's a very exciting report, but you were talking about the fact that it's certainly not the first of its kind, and you know firsthand that there have been studies showing this before. Am I correct? Yeah, right. So even back to the 1980s, um, top quality ABA intervention uh, agencies and, and uh, sites were recovering kids back then. So it's, it's nothing new, um, but what's new and exciting is the mainstream acknowledgement of this. So uh, we actually published a study in 2009 in the Annals of Clinical Psychiatry, a mainstream medical journal. Um, documenting uh, recovery in 38 cases that we treated here at CARD. Um, we, uh, basically what we did was we went back and retrospectively looked at, um, just tried to look through clinical records and look for data, uh, basically um, documenting, you know, the course of these kids' treatment. And we wrote it up and even used the word recovery in the title of the journal article. And we fully expected it to get rejected when we submitted it to a mainstream medical journal, because uh, it's still a somewhat controversial topic, um, but it was accepted. And uh, it was very exciting. And what we showed was basically something similar to what Fines Group is showing now. Um, back in 2009, we didn't have um, the full battery of assessments, though, that, that uh, Dr. Fine used in this study. And that's why it's exciting. Uh, her, her study is a very nice extension because it's showing with a lot greater detail, with a lot, uh, lot more additional assessments showing, look, in every area of functioning, these kids are doing great. And you mentioned that this is getting a lot of mainstream attention. You know, wh what, what kind of an outcome can this have for us and who is paying attention to this? Well, you know, if it's on all these mainstream news channels and everything else, I guess everyone's paying attention to some extent, which is very exciting. Um, you know, really, it just, I think, speaks in general to the issue of autism awareness and uh, um, awareness of the uh, that autism is treatable. So uh, when we talk about recovery and optimal outcome, uh, just people simply being aware of that as a possibility, I think really raises the stakes, right? Yes. So um, I'd say probably most people these days think, oh yeah, if you have autism, you should probably get some kind of treatment. It'll make you feel better or something like that. And you know, in general, awareness of treatability is increasing. Even in, in the last 10 years, it's increasing quite a bit. Um, but there's still little to no awareness of the possibility of recovery. And so, you know, quite honestly, it lights a fire under somebody when they realize, wait a minute, there's a possibility that we could completely reverse this disorder. You know, um, I think it, as people become aware of that, I think it will have an impact. I think people will realize, wow, it's not acceptable to, you know, just throw some treatment at these folks. If the treatment that produces recovery sometimes is 30 to 40 hours a week, Kids need to get that treatment, yes. not five hours a week, not 10 hours a week, not a mix of a few hours a week of ABA plus a bunch of other random stuff. No, they actually need to get the treatment that actually produces this outcome in some percentage of kids. So that's 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 what my hope is. Absolutely. And I, I notice it in looking at the study and looking at what's being said about it, there's, uh, there's a lot more that they're hoping to derive from this study, some questions that came from it. But one of the things that I hear parents talking about that they look Looked at and help me to understand this is what what things the kids had in common um, that led to that optimal outcome. That certainly it appears that having intensive treatment was a part of that. Um, but I'm also noticing in some of the reports that they're saying that the kids tended to be. Um, that they're, they were in a certain class of autism, that their language deficits were sometimes great, but that they had a little bit stronger suit where social interaction came into play. Is that accurate? I, you know, I'm actually forgetting right now off the top of my head, but I, I think there were, there were some minor differences that they found between the high functioning group and the optimal outcome group in terms of early functioning. And it might have had something to do with age, it might have had something to do with okay. slightly, uh, slightly better language and or socialization at intake. Um, however, you know, this study was not designed to identify predictors of optimal outcome. Okay. The study was designed to just demonstrate optimal outcome or recovery exists. Okay, so, so interesting because that's one of the things that the media has kind of glommed onto, that the parents are talking about. And if that's not what the design of the study is, then it, it can't be all that, we can't look at that with any assurity and say, oh, look, here's predictors. No, and they're not even trying to. I mean, of course, they, they're looking for, for information on that, just sort of, um, 
uh, to spur uh, future research that's specifically designed to predict out, uh, optimal outcome. But that's not the point of the study, and it really can't answer those questions. It can provide sort of you know food for thought essentially, but that's about it. Um, they also did uh, collect some other data that they didn't analyze for this study, and so I'm sure we'll be seeing the same group produce another study in the next year, um, looking at things like what treatments did the optimal outcome kids receive, and probably how much of it. You know, right. so what you might find, I wouldn't be surprised if they found something like um, a higher intensity of treatment in the optimal outcome group as opposed to the high functioning autism group, um, or a higher concentration of ABA treatment as opposed to a mix of various different treatments, um, probably uh, starting earlier uh, intervention at an earlier age. Um, you know, all of these types of things. But again, the group sizes are too small and the study is simply not designed to do that. Okay. Uh, what you would need to, to do to answer those questions is have a much larger group of kids um, and either systematically vary things like age and intake, intensity, and et cetera, and then look at the differences in outcome between the two groups. For example, if you had a 10 hour a week group of 100 kids and a 40 hour a week group of 100 kids, and after three years, compare rates of recovery between those groups, I guarantee you, you'd see a difference, right? No one's actually done that study since the original LOBOS study. Um, but, you know, it, it's those types of studies that we need to actually answer these questions more conclusively. And, and I have to say, you know, uh, I also looked at this and said, wow, this is stuff that, we, that my family has been aware of for a while, that recovery is possible, that that optimal outcome is possible. I think there are a lot of parents out there that have been aware of it for a while, but I am dismayed by the fact that there are still many people who don't know, and many of them are people who have children on the autism spectrum. So to me, it's like just adding another log to the bonfire of letting people know. And I do see that we're, it seems to me we're gaining ground. Can I tell you that the big thing that I saw happen uh, late last year that I, I said, wow, we're, we're, the, an impact is being made here. They did the Night of Too Many Stars, which is a wonderful fundraiser. Uh, that John Stewart heads up and has all these comedians come and they broadcast it on the Comedy Channel. And in the beginning of the show, John Stewart, who, according to some studies, is the most trusted news deliverer in the United States, which is a little interesting. It's ironic. Um, but he stood on the stage and said, listen, the thing we know about autism is that we can make substantive progress if we use the proper educational tools. And and I, you know, it, he didn't say ABA, but I think that everybody there pretty much knew what he was talking about. And I, and I thought, what a great thing to have come out of his mouth. Um, That's fantastic. That's I, you know, we were making a gesture at home about, yeah, <laughs> very exciting. Uh, so to me, there's there's a great deal of hope that this information will disseminate to everybody. And, and I'm loving that so many people are talking about this study. Now sure. you, go ahead. Uh, you know, another thing too is um, the fact that this that this research was funded by the National Institutes of, for Health of Health uh, is very significant, right? Yes. So that's sort of the major government source of funding for scientific research in healthcare. Um, and so, if NIH thinks some a topic matters or is possible or is a potential area of study, they'll specifically allocate research funding to support research um, on that topic. So um, very exciting that, that NIH is seeing, oh, re recovery is possible maybe, right? Yes. And so uh, uh, Dr. Thomas Insel, who's the director of NIH, um, is quoted talking about this study and how exciting it is. It's interesting. He he won't use the word recovery. You know, he, he as the director of the entire you know uh, organization, he's probably got to be pretty conservative about it. Right. But it's on his radar. He's seeing this is possible. Right. This is well, and I've always said, you know, if you don't like the word recovery, tell me a different, and if you want to use the word optimal outcome, okay. I have parents who refer to it as winning the autism lottery, um, but the fact remains uh, that it's possible, and that's the thing that we need to know. This is, this is something that is real. It's not an urban myth that children can get to the point where they're virtually indistinguishable from their peers. That's right. And, you know, another thing that's worth pointing out anytime we discuss the topic of recovery is... Is, um, it's not the only legitimate outcome of treatment for autism, right? And in right. fact, the majority of kids still aren't going to recover, even if they get the best possible treatment early on. Uh, but what can be a very, very meaningful outcome, in fact, very optimal for some kids, is just being able to function better in life, yeah. happier and more independent, and be able to communicate better uh, and not have destructive behavior. Um, so, you know, 
it's important to point that out too that you know absolutely some parents listening thinking well my, you know, my kid's not going to recover is that you know isn't he doing something pretty optimal too yeah and yeah you're darn right he is if he's learning how to you know be more independent in life and to you know live his full potential that's fantastic too and it's, it's, i think it's important to point that out yeah i i would agree and i'm so glad that you brought it up because uh my child is not deemed recovered and we couldn't be more thrilled with the progress that he has made and what he yeah. is able to do and and his out look for life and the kinds of things that he's going to be able to do and I'm and I met so many families along the way who are excited about the progress that their children have made that it isn't always about becoming virtually indistinguishable from peers but but honestly we I certainly couldn't tell can you tell when a child comes in what their fullest potential is is that even possible no, no, no. In fact, we have no idea. And that's why every single kid that comes through our door at a young age, you know, before the age of five or so, um, if they're able to get, you know, access to a full program, 30 to 40 hours a week, every single kid, when they come through the door, uh, the goal is recovery. Yeah. Because it's possible. And yeah. we can predict which child is going to recover and which one isn't. So why wouldn't we make that goal the goal for every child? Of course. Right. Um, and you know, yeah. And as as uh, treatment progresses, you start to get a better idea of maybe what their maximum potential is. But you don't know coming through the door. I mean, we've had kids who are, you know, can barely even hold their head up. Can't even don't, don't even have the muscle tone to sit up hardly. Zero communication. Tons of stereotypy. Tons of problem behavior. And you're thinking, wow, this is going to be a you know a pretty tough road. And the kid recovers. Yeah. So you just don't know. It's amazing what is possible. And we talk all the time, I'm wearing my ribbon. With ABA, the possibilities are infinite. And that's the message that we want everybody to hear, uh, including this, what they're referring to as optimal income. Pretty amazing. Uh, I, and I thank you so much for breaking this study down for us, because I feel like I understand it in a better way now. Will you be willing to stay with us for one, one more segment so we can sure. talk with you a little bit about goal setting? Yep, okay. That. All right. So we're going to take a break and we're going to come back with Dr. Tarbox. If you have any questions, now is an ideal time to ask them. Stick with us. Monica Holloway is a critically acclaimed author, speaker, and activist. She is also an autism mom. Her son, Wills, was diagnosed with autism at the age of three. Now, at the age of 15, Wills is a high school freshman attending a mainstream school. I'm in a brand new school. I'm in a great school that I love, and I'm really happy there. I made friends pretty quickly on the first day, uh -huh. and something interesting happened to me on the first day. Tell me. We were doing a art project with um, fabric markers, and there was a little label on it that said, squeeze for best results. Okay. And so I squeezed it and exploded. <laughs> all over the people at my table. Oh no! And we were all covered in little blue dots. I asked Wills, how he describes autism to people. I say that I have Asperger's syndrome, which is a slight form of autism. It doesn't make you any different. It really doesn't. It's just, it's just there and it just kind of makes you who you are. I asked Wills what he thought of the Sandy Hook shooter's actions being linked to autism. Please, please, just don't, don't be scared of autism. If, you, if somebody has autism, don't be scared of them. Chances are they're not violent. They're just like you or me. Monica is a proud mom with good cause. I asked her to describe Wills in five words. Generous, curious, funny, sensitive, loving. We had a chance to talk about the Sandy Hook massacre and how Monica heard the news. On Friday, when, it hap when the shooting happened in Connecticut, I was in my car and uh, my husband Michael called to tell me what had happened. And I was in a state of shock, as I think we all were, but that many children. And I felt, I guess, a mind can't take in that kind of information uh, without feeling nauseous. I, I felt it go from here all the way down my body. I started calling everybody I knew to tell them I loved them and um, I was thinking about them and I just wanted to be with the people that I knew. I started hearing more and more um, information come on the news about this shooter having Asperger's or being autistic. And then I started hearing things about, um, well, does autism cause violence? And I started, to, I was in a whole other level of shock. Never in a million years would I think that somebody might associate us and my son's face with the face of violence just because he has Asperger's. And I've seen bad days and good days and that's what kills me is like there was not a day bad enough to 
ever make me think that he or any of his friends could ever be violent. The only thing that made me even feel a little bit better to do something to help educate. And so we've started a campaign on my Facebook page, Cowboy and Wills, it's called I Am the Face of Autism. And please post a picture of yourself. It can be your child, your friend with autism. Let's put these beautiful faces of these people with autism on to wipe out the face of this murderer. Let's put our faces in front of his. Welcome back. We are talking with Dr. Jonathan Tarbox, the head of research and development at the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. We're talking to him via Skype. And uh, Dr. Tarbox, thank you so much for sticking with us for one more segment. I wanted to talk with you. Our topic for the week has been goal setting. Right. And I, I wanted to talk with you and get your point of view as someone who knows what you know uh, about uh, how we can set ourselves up for success when setting goals with an ABA perspective, both for our kids and for ourselves. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Great. Okay, so I'm glad you picked that topic because, you know, I'm always harping on and on about how positive reinforcement basically is ABA. It's the foundation of ABA, right? And that's certainly true, but um, I have to say goal setting and feedback about the goals, however you do the feedback, um, really is one of the other co core components. Without goals, you don't have ABA, period. And honestly, decades of research on human motivation and human performance have shown that uh, goal setting and feedback is one of the number one things that changes behavior behavior, period. So if you want a clinical team to do a good job teaching a kid with autism, that team needs goals. That they're okay. working. If you want to do a good job at your work, you need goals and you need feedback on your goals at, at, at your job. If you want to do a good job losing weight or exercising more or being more polite or what, whatever the goal is for your own personal change program, goal setting and feedback, regular feedback on your progress towards those goals is absolutely critical and it changes behavior. Okay, so um, anything that we want to, when, and when we're setting goals, any research that you can talk to us about sure. um, in terms of, you know, how attainable should the goal be? How do we want to have a mix of goals? What kinds of things can you tell us? Sure, yeah, so there's a bunch of recommendations on goal setting and uh, sort of the, probably the first one is that it's measurable and maybe that's obvious, but it really does need to be measurable. You can't say something like, uh, you know, I, I just want to be happier in my life or more content. Right. That's an admirable goal, and of course it matters, but how are you going to measure that? So you yeah. have to actually figure out a way to quantify it somehow or write it down somehow in some actual quantifiable way. So goals have to be measurable. I love that because my husband, and he won't appreciate me saying this, but he always says, well, I just want to be healthier. And I, and I go, what does that look like? <laughs> you know, does that mean you're eating less McDonald's, right. or, or does that so, mean that your cholesterol is 20 points lower? What is that? Right. Well, <laughs> and you know, exactly. And there's a lot of different things you can measure. So for healthier, you could you could measure your BMI. You could measure, you know, uh, how much weight. food you're eating per yeah. day. You can measure your weight. You can measure, you know, how many minutes of exercise you're doing. You could even maybe come up with some measure of how you feel, like how much right. energy you have. You know, right. you're like a, a zero to ten. Zero means I'm ready to fall asleep. Ten means I'm, you know totally energized right. and give yourself a rating every morning when you wake up out of bed, whatever, but it's got to be measurable. Okay. Uh, so you come up with a measurable goal. Uh, the second uh, recommendation that's totally critical is how difficult the goal should be. Um, y if you go either way on one side or the other of uh, the spectrum of difficulty, it's not going to work. So they say goals should be challengeable yet achievable. Okay. okay. So you start out by uh, visualizing or, or articulating your terminal goal. So let's say I want to lose, you know, 30 pounds might be the terminal goal. Or let's say I want to work up to running, a, you know, a five-minute mile might be the terminal goal, whatever it is. Um, but then that's that's not the goal, right? If you, if you set that goal, you're screwed. You're never going to hit Is that what I've been doing wrong? Okay. <laughs> All right, good. Set goals that are much more short term. So what's my goal for this week? Right. You might even want to back it up and say, what's my goal for this day? Just for today, what's my goal? Okay. Um, and the, the difficulty level should be challenging yet achievable. Right? Okay. If you don't, it's not one of those situations where you say, well, let's see, I, I better measure, you know, shoot pretty low just to make sure I can get it. Don't do that because then it's not going to work. It's not going to change behavior, right? But don't shoot too high or aim too high because then you're not going to achieve it and that's going to be aversive. And that's also not going to change behavior, right? Okay. If you set goals that are too high, you'll work really hard towards those goals for the first, you know, week or two. And then after that, you'll say, forget it. I can't do it. It's hopeless. And the whole point is it has to work, okay? You have to actually... Um, 
be able to achieve the goal. So uh, challenging yet achievable. Okay, <laughs> challenging but achievable. Wonderful. Yep. And we talked a little bit before about uh, doing preference assessments for ourselves and making sure that we reinforce ourselves Absolutely. and that we celebrate things along the way. Any tips for finding what's actually reinforcing to adults? Because I think that this is part of the problem, is finding the actual reinforcer. Yeah, I completely agree. And really even before that, just acknowledging uh, the idea of using reinforcement is actually a big part of the problem too because it's common in our culture to just sort of think, well, I should do this behavior just because or because right. I know it's the right thing to do, right? Like I should eat healthier because I want to live a longer <clears> life. <throat> look better in my bathing suit or whatever it is, right? I should, blah, blah, blah. Anytime you say should, dot, 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 you're basically living outside of ABA. Forget okay. it. It doesn't matter what should be. What matters is what works. What, okay? And what is, um, yeah. What is, exactly. So what is an effective reinforcer? What is a powerful motivator? Just talking about what you should do is not, okay? So just use reinforcement. Just accept that, first of all, that you okay. deserve that. Like if you're going to do a good job of significant behavior change in your life, you deserve a reward. That's fantastic, right? Um, so so that's the first step is just acknowledging that. Okay. Um, and then the second step is, uh, or a second recommendation is, pick something that um, that you can't really get any other way. And so, uh, you know, if you have dessert every night, then maybe that's not the best reward. Uh, well, although actually you could, as long as that was contingent on something else that day. But a better reward, especially for a longer term one, would be something that's just unreasonable. So think about think of a present that you would never buy yourself, but someone else might buy for you for Christmas or your birthday or something like that. And maybe that would be appropriate for reaching some, you know, maybe major milestone towards your terminal goal. I uh, love it. So let's say like, let's say two weeks or a month that you maintain whatever new program that you're proposing for yourself. If you actually maintain it properly for a month based on your behavior, not necessarily based on losing weight, right, or whatever else, but whatever goal you make for this is the behavior I'm going to do, I'm going to do it for a month. Um, at the end of the month, you should buy something kind of unreasonable, like okay. something you wouldn't normally spend money on. So maybe it's a massage, maybe it's a trip to the spa, maybe it's a new pair of shoes or new purse or something like that that you know you don't really need. Uh, okay. Don't do something practical. Do something you don't need that'll just make you feel good. I uh, love it. So I so absolutely good. love that. Yeah, That's you know, great advice. Know, Expensive. It can be something kind of ridiculous, you know, that just is not something you'd normally do. Well, and what comes to mind for me is that I always, uh, especially now that my son is at school and I don't get to be with him during the day, I never take the time to go do something without him. My yeah. husband asks me constantly, and I say, I don't want to give up time with him. That seems foolhardy because I get less time with him. Right. And for me to take an afternoon and say, I'm going to let them go to a movie and I'm just going to be by myself seems like an unreasonable, really extravagant, costs no more money, right. but would be a really wonderful reward for me. It, you know, that's a perfect example because it doesn't cost anything. And right. it, it would be maybe unreasonable as a parent to do that every single day. Right. It's completely reasonable to do it every couple weeks or once a month. Yeah. If you've actually achieved something really important to you, that's fantastic. Yeah. But I don't allow for it, and, and that would be a great reinforcer for me. I'm going to have to try that and see how that works. We're almost out of time, but I thank you for all the wonderful information that you gave us today. And I want to, I want to leave you by asking you, our question of the day today was, what is your greatest talent as a parent? Uh, and we also had, what's your greatest talent? So, But I'm going to ask you as a parent, what is, because you've got two wonderful, beautiful children, what is Dr. Jonathan Tarbox's uh, greatest talent as a parent? Well, ironically, I'm, you know, uh, a researcher on treatment of challenging behavior, so you'd think I'd be good at behavior management, but uh, that's certainly not <laughs> what it. Well, you know what they say about the cobbler's shoes? The, the, the cobbler's kids never have shoes. That's what they say. So uh, that's okay. But what is your talent? Probably just having fun, just I'm, being fun, you know, which doesn't necessarily make you the best disciplinarian, but uh, it's I great. think I'm very good at making my kids laugh and just having fun and just making them feel good in the moment. I believe that, and that's a wonderful talent. I think that that's absolutely superlative. Now, next week, we don't have you because you're at ABAI, is that correct? That's correct, yep. And let's take one minute to just talk about what that is and what you're going to be talking about at ABAI. Right, sure. So uh, ABAI um, Autism is the annual conference that uh, the Association for Behavior Analysis International puts on specifically devoted to autism. So it's pretty much all um, applied behavior analysis, but specifically for autism. And there's two different tracks. There's a professional track and there's a parent track. Uh, so parents are highly encouraged to go. You're going to see lots of presentations that will be um, of practical utility for you and your, your child's program. Um, and professionals also can go and learn about uh, research and learn about, um, you know, 
you know, uh, the latest developments uh, for professionals as well. Um, it's, I think, two or three days long. I think I believe it's, uh, yeah, it's Saturday, pretty much all day Saturday and then most of the day Sunday. Um, and uh, it's great. It's going to be in Portland. Uh, it's all day. Um, it's a lot of information to yes. take. But, uh, but the presentations are also a little bit longer. Most of the presentations are about an hour long. Uh, so that it actually gives you enough time to actually get some useful information as a parent. And your topic? My topic is teaching perspective taking and executive functions to kids with autism. So more of the sort of complex skill acquisition stuff, self-management, perspective taking, understanding how other people feel, what they intend, uh, all that kind of stuff. So I'm going I'm to share some of the research that we've done here at CARD on these topics and uh, give some advice on uh, how to teach some of these skills. And we should be clear that you're part of the professional track, but there is a way that parents, you'll have to ask them at ABAI, but you, there is a way that they can attend if they choose to. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no one's. <coughs> It's just uh, which audience is sort of the target audience for each track. Right. Uh, so, yeah, I'm speaking at the professional track. Um, but parents are certainly invited to that as well. And I want to encourage parents that, uh, you know, you'll have a lot to do there, but if they're there that they and if they've seen you on the show, to go up to you and introduce themselves Absolutely. so that they, they have an opportunity to meet you in person because you are a delight to meet in person. Well, thank you. And, you know, it's worth pointing out that that's the point of these professional conferences is for people to get to know each other and network. So I highly encourage parents to go to these conferences and just walk up to somebody and introduce yourself and shake, yeah. shake their hand. I mean, that, that is the purpose of the conference. And people, people, most professionals feel um, ingratiated by yeah. that. You know? I mean, and honestly, thank you for saying that because I think a lot of us feel like, oh, we don't want to infringe on your time and, you know, you're this big important person that you do all this important work and we don't want to, you know, uh, bother you. But uh, any time that I have gotten over it and I get over it all the time and go up and introduce myself, people are usually wonderful and I know that about you, that you're wonderful about it. No, people love it because you're, you're giving them positive reinforcement, right? Who's not going to like go. that? I mean, obviously, use your social skills and don't dominate the person. <laughs> Because there's other stuff they got to do too, but right. you know, say a brief introduction and a little bit of praise or whatever, or a quick question is great. Yeah, that's, but that's what we like. Absolutely. So I hope some of you will take advantage of that. We want to thank you, Dr. Tarbox, for being with us today, and we hope that you uh, have a wonderful time being a dad this weekend. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Enjoy the weekend too. Take care. Take care. Bye bye. Bye. <clears throat>I'm Bryce Myler and I'm the Contracts Director for the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. I've been here for about five years. CARD has several employees with many years of insurance experience uh, dealing with insurance, dealing with pre-authorizations, dealing with discovering whether there's coverage or not. So we have more experience than any ABA provider that I've ever come across. So for, for a prospective client, somebody that may be interested in you know ABA therapy and what CARD has to offer. We have a special 800 number um, and you call that number. They will talk to you about what we have to offer, uh, how ABA works, he'll ask you for the front and back of your ID card and then we check to see if you do or do not have coverage. If you have coverage for ABA therapy, we try to do whatever we can to set it up where we can bill for you and you don't have to fight with the insurance company every month to get your claims paid. For California residents, we recently did a series of insurance trainings all over the state and you can click on the link below to watch pretty much the full presentation. It has a lot of information how you can get your insurance company to to comply with what they're supposed to do, uh, understanding the networks and many other um, valuable pieces of information. Welcome back. We're here at the end of the show, at the end of the week. It's been a pretty amazing week, and there are a couple of things that I want to bring to your attention before uh, we leave for the week. Uh, one of them is the story of Luke. This is the amazing film that uh, we showcased a couple of weeks ago. It's about a month ago now that we had the director and the producer and the star of the film, Lou Taylor Pucci, who actually plays Luke in the film. Uh, we had them here talking with us. We got to see an early screening of the film.
And Nancy Oswald Jackson and myself just loved it. And uh, I know it may seem like I love a lot of things. You, you have to know I don't. There's a whole lot of things we don't talk about because I don't love them. <laughs> and I really loved this film, and I particularly loved uh, Lou Taylor Pucci in it. I just thought his portrayal of this young man, Luke, who's on the autism spectrum and is having to make a transition into adulthood at a time when the, his main caretaker has died. Oh, just beautiful. And if it sounds like it's this really serious film, then I've done a disservice to it because it is funny. It is very funny in all the right ways, not making fun of uh, autism at all. In fact, making fun of a lot of other people's reactions in the world and pointing out you know, that sometimes the person with the autism is the person who's seeing things clearly. Really beautiful film. Okay, why am I talking about it now? Because there is a screening, there are a bunch of screenings of this film that are coming up because it's about to go into distribution. And so this Sunday, if you are in the California, Southern California area, at the Irvine International Film Festival, you can screen this movie. It's January 20th at 6.30 p.m. And you can go to www.thestoryofloop.com to not only find out how you can get tickets to that, but to hear about when and how this movie is gonna become available to you to see. So that that's this weekend, January 20th at 6.30 p.m. That's the story of Luke. As this show ends, I want to remind you that the conversation continues. Matt's going to show you a bunch of different ways that you can get in touch with us even over the weekend. We are going to be back Monday uh, live on this show. We start at 1 p.m. Eastern Time, 10 a.m. Uh, Pacific Time, and we will go for two hours live, and we'll be taking your live questions then. Um, also want to remind you that uh, we have... Dr. Doreen Grampuche coming with us on Wednesdays. Uh, really a remarkable person uh, who's been working in this field of autism, as she said the other day, for over three decades. Really amazing. Uh, and she answers your questions live on the air on Wednesday morning, starting at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. But you can write those questions in. I really am seeing that, you know, the best way to get your question answered is to send it ahead of time because uh, it gets filled up during the live show. We eventually get to things, but if you want to get your question answered on Wednesday, send me something today, and I will put it at the top of the list, okay? And also want to remind you that this, we're down to the last couple of days to get those t-shirts for the Paper Clouds Apparel. Uh, there are two really cute t-shirts. I have to, you know, admit that my son did the drawing for the boys t-shirt. Those are available. They're on bamboo, so they're really soft, and part of the proceeds goes to the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. So check that out at paperapparel.com, papercloudsapparel, excuse me, dot com. And we'll let you know next week about um, how that all turned out. I thank you for being here with me during this time. You guys uplift me, you teach me, you help me to grow, and I appreciate you for being here. I hope you'll continue to do so through all the exciting things that we have coming up because we do have a lot of exciting things in the shoot for you more of those i'll talk about including temple grandin um <clears throat> Very, very exciting. Uh, but we do take breaks, and you can continue to watch the live show and watch it in all those different ways that we were just showing you on the screen. I hope you will. And until we meet again, please give your kiddos a hug from me. Bye-bye for now.